Elon Musk just announced that his company XAI has raised $6 billion in a Series B funding with a company now valued at $24 billion plus money. Bill Lee, a famous venture capitalist and entrepreneur who was an early investor in Tesla, SpaceX, XAI, and other Musk companies, tweeted out emojis that represented robot brain. Well, Elon liked this post, maybe confirming that XAI will be the brains to Tesla's Optimus bot. Would this plan be good for Tesla? Does it make sense? I've got Hans Nelson joining us. We're going to go and review, you know, Tesla's supercomputer plans, XAI's computer plans. Why do they are not working together? How and how they might work together? And there's a lot of controversy, a lot of upset Tesla investors. We'll walk you through all of that. Welcome, Hans. Thanks for having me, Herbert. Hans has his own YouTube channel, Hans C. Nelson. Check him out when you have a chance. Let's go through the news here. So this is uh, big news yesterday. XAI announced that they are doing a Series B funding round. They closed $6 billion. Um, Elon, you know, kind of teased a little bit that there'll be more to announce in the coming weeks. Is he referring to XAI? Is he referring to partnership with Tesla? There is, There has been some conversation by Elon in the past saying that Tesla may have a you know, ownership of XAI. That would have been interesting if they had already done that as part of this funding round. Um, the pre-money valuation was $18 billion. So plus the six were $24 billion already for a company he just formed a year ago. It's crazy. But this is the main topic I want to get right to right away. So Bill Lee, a very famous venture capitalist, entrepreneur, he's a big investor in Tesla and Musk companies. And he tweeted out this, robot brain and elon liked it robot brain let's talk a little bit about uh what are the ways that tesla and xai could work together so there are really two different areas of research when it comes to artificial intelligence right now in the world of elon he's got tesla and they are doing a lot of research on how do we apply artificial intelligence to real world problems through two different means. One of those is going to be the car. So they're trying to solve self-driving. Um, that is real world artificial intelligence. The other one is through Optimus. The Optimus bots are going to be vessels for artificial intelligence to accomplish real world tasks and um, in most instances to do work. But the... There's a challenge, you know, if you just want them to do tasks, the question is how generally intelligent do they need to be? You could just have different task, uh, narrow, you know, artificial, it's called ANI, artificial narrow intelligence, that is the ability of that robot to do whatever that task is. And then if they need to do a new task, well, then they just download a new task app from the app store and they redeploy and do that separate thing. Um, so we don't really know what the application of artificial intelligence in Optimus is going to look like fully fleshed out into the future, especially to begin with. You know, the, the compute that Optimus will have on board is powerful on the one hand, but also limited when you think about it on the other hand. It's not a fully... You know, it's not the type of compute that we're using to run a lot of artificial intelligence workloads, which are going to be in the cloud. And that's why, you know, they don't run on your laptop. They don't run on your phone. You know, your device, when you're interacting with ChatGPT, is going and making requests that those requests are then being processed by a large computer that's a long ways away from you. And then the results of that are being returned to you. Um and that's going to be true for Optimus robots as well. That, um, or sorry, the what the Optimus robot is doing on its own is going to be limited compared with being able to do that cloud interface, unless you have a a large cloud that you can connect them to that is close enough in time, whether that's close, you know, physically or not. Um, and so, anyways, all of that to say that the the landscape there's there's constraints on how you develop artificial intelligence and how you actually put it into use in the real world and 
the field of artificial intelligence is so big that you really have two different things that you're focused on. One is general intelligence. And I would say that that is the world that OpenAI and DeepMind are working towards. It's just research that's on the frontier of how smart can we make artificial intelligence. And it's mostly disconnected from having it operate in the real world. It's mostly just processing language or processing video or operating in purely digital realms. And then there is some work right now that is going on by, you know, companies like NVIDIA or OpenAI. Um, and then Google has some initiatives in their own things. They're trying to figure out, okay, now let's take this frontier digital artificial intelligence that we've developed and let's figure it out. How do we make that actually operate inside of robotics? And then, you know, Tesla is kind of coming at things from the other end where they're like, okay, these are the computers that we have, hardware three in the cars or hardware four in the cars uh, in the future and or the current um, the current cars and moving forward have hardware four and then eventually they'll be on hardware five. Like what's the smartest thing that we can put in these hardware packages that can run not necessarily attached to the cloud? Um, and how do we get them to solve these tasks like driving or like factory work without having to tap into this general intelligence? Um, and those are, they're really two kind of different challenges. There are different ways to solve the problem and they both have their pros and their cons. Um, and it, so it looks like Elon is obviously interested in having his hat in the ring in both places. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. But then the argument is that, well, Tesla does FSD. FSD is under Tesla's, you know, purview. And this is basically taking Tesla's FSD and applying it real world, understanding the world, making decisions, neural nets, planning it. How do you see that they're actually different? So if you think back, like, why is Apple one of the most valuable companies in the world? Well, part of it is that they create this platform that then lots of other industries can take part of. And then mm -hmm. if you add up all those different things that Apple makes possible, that's actually a much larger market overall than just Apple and the smartphone market. So you've got things like Uber and Airbnb and many other software 2.0 companies that all of their value, all of their market cap is actually built on top of but surpasses Apple. Like if you if you add up all those other things, it's much, much, much bigger than the valuation of Apple. And that much, much bigger thing is the thing yeah. that Apple or that Tesla is pursuing directly by having the Optimus robot. If you think of artificial intelligence in the real world, they are they're going after the applications of artificial intelligence in the real world not necessarily trying to create a platform. That's NVIDIA is more trying to create the platform that other people, and not only by creating the hardware and the GPUs that they make, but also they have all sorts of research tools and um, ways that they're trying to help robotic startups do training on their robots. And so they're really trying to pursue that um, base AI platform opportunity that would be analogous to the Apple iPhone opportunity for the age of artificial intelligence. And Elon and Tesla are really trying to aim straight at the, let's let's figure out how to go and make the Ubers and the Airbnbs and all of these other huge applications um, without necessarily trying to be a platform for other people to solve those problems on their own. And the, I think the opportunity is larger for Tesla if they can do that correctly than the opportunity that NVIDIA is trying to pursue at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And it, like you said earlier, they're actually very different, right? One is uh, real world vision, understanding the environment, but then the other one is large language model. You need both and both need to come in. How do you talk to the bot? What do they say back? 
those kind of things. Very different. Um, I can see. So both companies are creating supercomputers. So let's share that information and then come back to this conversation. So with XAI, the announcement was that they're going to build a supercomputer. They're going to call it the Gigafactory of Compute. And this is why they're raising that money. So the plan is to build a supercomputer with 100,000 specialized GPUs, which would be at least four times larger than the biggest AI cluster today. I think Elon has said that uh, very soon they're going to be surpassing the even OpenAI's GPT-4. The massive gigafactory of compute could help the young startup catch up to older and better funded rivals. OpenAI, Microsoft uh, would require billions of spending and significant power access. He, has, he hopes to have it running by the fall of 2025. So that's still next year. And then we've already previously announced that they could partner with Oracle. It's going to have the largest H100 chip customer. Um, they would accelerate XAI's Grok A1 Assistant with fewer speech restrictions. But this will require a location that's remote and have a lot of power. So this is the big rush. Everybody's trying to create the largest GPU clusters so that you can have the strongest, most powerful AI. But Tesla themselves has their own plans for a supercomputer. We know that they're creating one in um, Buffalo, New York. This is Sawyer saying he, there's somebody who shared a photo, a flyover, and they showed this part. Love all the glass design at the end. Here's, here's the Gigafactory Texas. Elon replied saying the rear portion of the factory extension, the part furthest away from the glass, will be a super dense, water-cooled supercomputer cluster. So even Tesla is going to be creating a supercomputer cluster as well. Thoughts on the fact that both companies are creating supercomputers? Yeah, and, and of roughly the same size. I mean, we don't know what the plan for Tesla's supercompute cluster, for what the size of that is going to be next year the stated goal for this year is that we'll reach you know roughly 85,000 h100 equivalents i believe by the end of 2024 um so then by fall of 2025 we could be significantly larger than that but just knowing that they're planning to have 100,000 h100 equivalents in the fall of 25 for xai i mean that is the same that's bigger than what tesla is uh planning just for this year. So very large, you know, you can just say both of them, very large supercompute clusters, um, and they are kind of independent of one another. And this is one of the things that I think has a lot of people frustrated in the Tesla community um, is that they think that, well, those resources should have been secured for Tesla instead of for XAI. And the question right now is, you know, I, I don't know that that's a fair assessment because Elon has said that we're currently not compute constrained. There are other bottlenecks that we have that we have to figure out how to solve. Hmm. Currently, that Good is point. the validation bottleneck. And so if we had secured all of these compute resources for Tesla, but compute's not the bottleneck, well, that doesn't seem like the most efficient use of shareholder funds and re the resources of Tesla overall. Um, to solve these AI problems. The other thing that I think we need to just keep in our minds is that frontier AI model research has always been something that is separate in Elon's mind from developing real world AI at Tesla. And you don't have to go any further than the fact that he started open AI or funded um, mm -hmm. and helped to found OpenAI outside of Tesla originally. The goal of doing that was to create a check and a balance against DeepMind and Google's capabilities in frontier AI research. And so that's why Elon started that originally. And, he, and that was not started inside of Tesla. And there were very practical reasons why it was not started in Tesla. One of them was the same thing that he has cited when he started XAI, that it's just hard to get the people who are capable of doing that research to come inside of your big company to do that specific type of research. Getting people to develop, like you can't go to any research field. I mean, like you go to Waymo, there, there's a couple of startups, you go to Cruise, there, but there are a very limited number of options for people who actually want to develop autonomous driving. Um, and Tesla does not have 
any issues competing for talent when that talent is focused on solving the autonomous driving problem. And they're not going to have that problem for people that want to develop the applied AI in Optimus robots either. But those, that set of people is a different set of people from the Andre Karpathy's of the world when Andre decides he's done with FSD and he wants to go back and tinker with Frontier AI again. And that's why he went back to OpenAI. He he started at OpenAI, then he came to Tesla, then he went back to OpenAI because the types of problems that OpenAI is trying, trying to solve are just different problems than Tesla is trying to solve. There is some shared application that maybe down the road can they can work out a partnership between XAI and Tesla, or, you know, right now OpenAI is trying to figure out how their LLMs can be integrated into these robots, but they're not running the robots end to end. There's still a whole lot of other software that has to be developed that OpenAI is not doing that has to be figured out in order to get those things to work properly as well. Um, and so that's why, you know, he had to start OpenAI to begin with. And then once OpenAI became captured and he was no longer involved in it, and now it became the Microsoft version of Google and DeepMind, well, he felt like there's no proper check and balance that he has influence over on those. And so, you know, people just need to remember that XAI's ambitions are much more to continue to be a check and balance on centralized um, major players in frontier AI development being Microsoft and OpenAI, being Google and DeepMind. Um, Meta is kind of the third place in that. And I would say that, you know, there is somewhat of a proof case that a startup can go and compete with those people because Anthropic was only started in 2021. That's only three years ago. So, you know, two years before XAI was started. And Claude has been an incredible competitor to open AI and to what Google and DeepMind have been putting out. And so there's, you know, a possibility that, you know, those that XAI could do what Claude has been able to do in as far as being able to catch up quickly and develop highly capable pieces of software. And I think it's good, like I said, to just go back to the fact that they're there are two different ways to solve the problem. And while there can be some synergies between them, the talent pools are separate. And also the the compute resources needed, it is a, it is a big problem. Um, but if Tesla is not currently compute limited, then we shouldn't be worried about the fact that there are other areas of AI research that also need lots of compute. And if, as long as those things aren't slowing down Tesla, then it shouldn't really matter to us as shareholders. It can all be solved very easily if they announce that Tesla has a stake as shares of XAI. He did say that Twitter or X is going to have shares of XAI. And uh, if he does this, it makes sense. The other, so that's the part I think I'm really hoping for, then everybody will just realize that this is all going to work together, just like all of his companies, they work together and it makes so much sense because they're so vertically integrated. Um, but the other thing that somebody was mentioning, I've been having this conversation with more more people, Elon has said that he wants to have 25% control. He's concerned about the bots becoming sentient and doing warfare, mm -hmm. being controlled to do things that are not good for society. And he doesn't want to lose control. Well, if the brains is actually in XAI that he controls, he controls that really, really well, then he can partner with Tesla, have Tesla still make all those robots, have the brains, and he still has that feeling that, you know, I can, I have this control. It can't be... I can control if I needed to. That could be one way that he gets passed through all of this, right? Doesn't that make a lot of sense? I mean, there's definitely a pathway for that to be the case. I mean, I think that at least for the near term, for the next five years, probably, the application of Grok and whatever it is that XAI mm -hmm. produces is primarily going to be Twitter. It's not like it will have an impact on Tesla. It will be used to solve some of the problems that 
the Optimus project has to solve, but it's going to be a smaller percentage of the Optimus stack. And it's going to be a large percentage. I would say that you know, just my complete speculation that 70% or more of the application of the technology that comes out of XAI is going to be applied to Grok in Twitter and whatever other ways that they decide to release that as competitors to open AI products and very, very little of that, yeah, you know, I as a percentage basis is going to yeah. end up in the, in Optimus. Um, mm. But I think that the, whatever that last little piece is, is going to be important. And I think that there's lots of opportunities for, like you said, there to be partnerships where Tesla can license this piece. Um, and, you know, I, I still think it's an open question. A lot of people just assume that the breakthrough for artificial general intelligence is going to happen in this disembodied world of LLMs. And we forget that there's a whole other group of artificial intelligence researchers who firmly believe that a disembodied form of artificial intelligence is never going to be capable mm -hmm of reaching artificial general intelligence. And so, you know, this could be kind of a moot argument. It could be that artificial general intelligence ends up getting developed inside of Tesla because they are trying to solve these applied embodied pro uh, problems and create these products uh, compared to, to XAI. And so we, we don't really know what the shape of the problem between here and AGI is or the correct pathway for the solution either. So I, I know a lot of people are going to be very upset and they're going to wring their hands and pull their hair out uh, for one reason or another. But I mean, that's just the story of being invested in Tesla. It seems like there's always someone who's doing that for some reason, literally 99% of all the days that I've been invested mm -hmm. in Tesla. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just disagreeing because I think Grok's um, or, you know, this open AI, conversational AI is the way you can interact with the bot, the way that you're going to interact with Tesla's cars. It's going to be alive. It's going to have personalities. You can answer it any question. It's going to come from Grok. And so the Grok's influence in Tesla is going to be much bigger uh, than just 30%. That's what you're saying. Tesla may, if if they start to rely on XAI to create the Grok and then use that. I think it's great. They should. But then um, then it becomes like, yeah, they're not going to need to create themselves in the future. But that's just an interface layer. I would agree that it will need some of those things. But that mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that that layer that you put on mm -hmm. top of everything else where that robot has to figure out, like, how does it manage its power? How does it plan movements in the real mm -hmm. world? How does it actually accomplish? Right. Like, that's gotcha. just the 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 interface, yeah, the medium in between humans and the bots, and that is important. Um, but there's still a whole lot of really hard work that has to be done that all sits underneath of that interface. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. um, it hasn't been solved yet. That we don't have robots that can do those things well at this point in time. And um, yeah, yep. so that that's all I was saying on that part is that. XAI is not going to solve those problems for Tesla. Tesla's got a whole lot of deep work that needs to be made. In, it, it needs to look like there's nothing going on there, that it is just the interface, but it's not that that's right. a, an extremely complicated problem. Okay. So you explained quite a bit, actually. It's very good. So first of all, people shouldn't be worried because Tesla is a leader in compute. So he's already said, right, in that graph of who has the most compute, you've got meta by far. Then you've then he said, you know, Tesla appeared in number six. He goes, actually, Tesla's number two, and XAI is number three. And um, and then now you're hearing announcements of supercomputers, and Tesla has his own supercomputer, so does XAI. So it's not like um, you know, that they're not doing something for Tesla, and it's like, oh, I'm doing everything for XAI. And in fact, it's the opposite. If Elon has his separate company. He's able to raise six billion. He's able to get more money flowing to be able to build more compute, more than if you were just doing it through Tesla, is my thinking. And so therefore, Tesla actually benefits from a separate entity. You know, that's interesting debate we can have. Let's talk about Dojo. 
This uh, photo came out there. I have no idea where it came from, but it looks like it's Tesla's Dojo training wafer, uh, TSMC Info. That's TMC's obviously their their provider uh, partnership with Tesla, and they showed an example of a Dojo training wafer. You can explain to us what that looks like, and this is the initial thing that came from Tesla's uh, PowerPoint slide. At one point, this is where it where it fits into this training cluster. Tell, tell us a little bit more about this. I know you and I did a, a show already on how powerful this is, but um, yeah, give us an update. Yeah, so info, I would recommend for people who haven't seen it yet, there's a Tom's Hardware article that talks about TSMC's announcement that they made this year that going back, apparently the very first, this is what I've heard. I, I can't confirm this with 100% uh, certainty, but what I've heard is that the very first version of Tesla uh, Dojo chips were developed using this Info SOW process, which SOW stands for System on Wafer. And so what they're doing here is that they are when when computer chips are made, they're always manufactured on these big circular wafers like this. Um, but the problem is that there's a known failure rate that they can't produce it with 100% uh, quality. And so there's going to be some individual chips on this large wafer that are not good. And those need to be cut out and thrown away. And so what Tesla's doing is they are having these uh, Dojo chips, the D1 dies, they're being manufactured on their own wafer first and then 25 known good dojo chips are then taken and they are attached then to another one of these wafers and they're using the wafer as the way that information gets from one chip over to another chip and it's a different way of handling chip to chip communications than traditional semiconductor packaging and it actually is part of how Tesla was able to achieve such high um, bandwidth communication from D1 chip to D1 chip. And it's very powerful. And it's, you know, this is a new way to produce computer chips and do the entire system packaging than we've used in the past. But it also has some limitations um, because while you can put a chip and embed it directly onto a wafer below it, there are other types of components that are major parts of how these systems get produced that aren't able to be mounted directly on the wafer. And so that's what in the Tom's Hardware article, TSMC said that they're working on trying to solve that problem in their next generation system on wafer, which I think they referred to as COWSOW. Uh, which was chip on wafer and then system on substrate or system on wafer um, where that allows them to take these components like high bandwidth memory, for example, would be a good example. They mount a high bandwidth memory directly onto a chip. So we'll assuming they're going to do this for Dojo and we'll call it the D2 chip. I don't know what version it's going to be, but they could mount high bandwidth memory directly to a D2 Dojo chip and then mount that D2 Dojo chip directly to the wafer. And then that would allow them to build a system that has high bandwidth memory that is close to the chips that allows it to do all of the, the networking that it needs to do. And then for those chips to handle the communication to other chips through the wafer underneath it. And that is one of the limitations of the current Dojo architecture is that it has it doesn't have a whole lot of memory that is nearby any of those chips, that all that memory is away from all of those chips. And the reason they couldn't put it close by the chips is because they were using this uh, info sal process from TSMC. And so it, it does unlock a lot of potential moving forward if they can solve that problem. That's why TSMC, I believe, said that the next generation going into production in 2027 could have 40 times higher performance than the existing versions of Dojo. And we'll just kind of have to wait and see if that 
40 times better performance makes Dojo competitive with something like an NVIDIA chip, whatever the, the 2027 version of NVIDIA chips is. Um, <clears throat> but it is, you know, it, it's exciting because like I said, it's a new way to build chips. And I would assume that the reason, you know, Tesla is the only customer that TSMC has publicly announced is using this process. And we know that the Dojo chip was the first chip to use this process. My, once again, speculation on the reason why Tesla is working on pioneering this whole new way to build systems is because they were ordering a volume of chips that was small enough to where this process was able to meet the volume that Tesla was needing. Whereas while, you know, I'm sure NVIDIA would love to be able to build chips this way at some point in the future, I highly doubt that TSMC can make the number of chips that NVIDIA wants to order from them using this brand new process. And so it probably has to scale up with a smaller customer that doesn't have the size of needs that NVIDIA has. And this is actually one of those classic problems that Clayton Christensen talks about in The Innovator's Dilemma, that when a new technological disruption comes along, it's very, very hard for big existing incumbent companies to take advantage of those things because the new technology starts out as a much smaller market than the existing market that the incumbent is going after. And so it, it's unable to meet the needs of this big, large company. And so other companies that are the right size for that smaller market to be able to satisfy their mm -hmm. needs actually uses it. They grow up built on that uh, foundation. And then as the capabilities of that technology grows exponentially over time and becomes much more capable than the old technology, well, then it's new companies who have grown mm -hmm. along with the new technologies that end up being built on that technology and have all of the pieces in place in order to basically disrupt the old companies. And that's the story that we've seen play out in technology time and time again. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for explaining that. Um, you know, I wanted to cover this again because it does look like that Tesla, right? I mean, they've been planning this for years. Dojo may have been delayed a little bit, but there's gonna be a leap that's coming. They are building supercomputers. They do have real world AI. They have, you've got XAI raising money, creating their supercomputer, creating their version of Grok that's going to be a partnership with Tesla's robots and cars. So at the end of the day, yes, some people are concerned, why is this not being done at Tesla? But you explained already that XAI really was, you know, he originally started OpenAI a long time ago. And then because of, you know, a fallout between the relationships there and where OpenAI decided to go, Elon was forced to create XAI. Otherwise, it would have been a separate entity regardless. It would have been OpenAI all along anyways. Now he has full control of it. So it's actually a benefit to Tesla and could actually solve some of the big issues about the 25% control, control. I think it's all going to turn out well. We'll see. But uh, that's where we're at. Thank you so much, Hans. Appreciate you covering, especially topics like today. You really do provide so much uh, background knowledge and information explaining to all of us. Follow him on his YouTube channel, Hans C. Nelson. Thanks, everybody. Bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.